There is a big difference between our military and our local law enforcement, and we don't want those lines blurred. President Obama last week signaling he would be looking into how police are armed with military weapons. A review now underway. Images like these from Ferguson, Missouri, stunned the nation and highlighted the trend of militarizing police departments across the country. And now we're learning new disturbing facts about how those departments are mishandling that equipment. A report from Fusion shows 184 state and local police departments have been suspended from the Pentagon's military equipment program for missing weapons or for failure to comply with other guidelines. And the details are very disturbing. In Mississippi, 12 rifles, a pistol, and a shotgun have all disappeared. In Arkansas, M14 and M16 assault rifles are gone. A night vision scope is missing, and five shotguns are unaccounted for. Even worse, local police departments have had two military Humvees stolen or improperly sold, though they were later recovered. I mean, how do you lose a Humvee? What's happening with all of this military hardware? Too many police officers don't have the training for these weapons or a need to use them. Things have gone too far. We have to go back to real community policing to restore not just order, but trust in local police departments. Joining me now is Dr. Cedric Alexander, president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives and chief of police for DeKalb County, Georgia. And Congresswoman Gwen Moore, Democrat from Wisconsin, she's one of several lawmakers who signed a letter to the president urging him to create a national commission on police tactics and appoint a federal czar to monitor local police departments. Thank you both for being here. Let me go to you first, Congresswoman. I understand you fractured your elbow and came straight from the hospital here. You really do honor your commitment, so let me go to you first. I'm glad you're here and that you're all right. Always glad to be with you, Reverend Al. Let me ask you this. Doesn't this new report about police literally losing M-16s support your call for a review of police tactics? Absolutely, because we are all very committed to community-oriented uh, policing. Um, policing where the police really are stakeholders in, in the community. Uh, and this is a far cry. Uh, from community-oriented policing. I think it started out as an idea of just getting, you know, uh, rid of surplus military weaponry and providing that to local uh, police forces. Uh, but we do need to review and monitor uh, how this equipment is used and for what purposes it's used, especially uh, when it, it, it goes missing. Now, Dr. Alexander, there, there's a new poll out on public attitudes toward policing. 65% said police departments did only a fair or poor job on holding officers accountable for misconduct. 65% said they didn't go, uh, they didn't do a great job of treating racial and ethnic groups equally. And 61% say they weren't using the right amount of force. This is a national issue. How do we address it? Well, I think, uh, 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 Reverend Al, we got to go back and we got to look here again historically at this country who has not, this country has not had a very good relationship in terms of policing and communities of color. There have been strained relationships. We know that historically, and it continues to exist today. Now, I also must note, though, that there has been tremendous uh, uh, gain in terms of many parts and many cities across America where communities and police are working well together. But there's a lot of work in this country still left to be done. And what we saw in Ferguson, I think, is just a good example of some of those locations throughout this country where police and community are not working together. The police are going to have to do a better job at reaching out to communities, making themselves available not just for calls of service, but also being there in a very community-oriented kind of way where police is getting to, are getting to know their community and that community is getting to know police as well, too. So I'm not surprised by those numbers. They could be worse. But, however, I, it's, it's just an indication to me there's just a whole lot of work left still to be done. 
Congresswoman, let me go back to you and ask uh, about something with that letter you wrote the president. Uh, you also touched on several issues. Uh, you, you included uh, police training, engagement with police, and federal oversight of local law enforcement agencies. How would these uh, efforts help prevent another Ferguson? Well, Reverend, Reverend Al, I think we, have a, we need a larger conversation about the criminalization of black men in America. Uh, you know, as your other guest has just mentioned, this is a legacy issue. And I think, you know, to speak on behalf of the police to some extent, you know, institutions, society fails young black men a long time before they're 18 years old. I mean, they're, they have higher than average rates of suspensions in school. Um, they find themselves unemployed and unemployable. Uh, and police uh, are there, and, and they see young black men uh, as a threat because of all of the marginalization that's occurred uh, prior to uh, the encounter, say, between an officer and Michael Brown. So a czar. Uh, uh, to, to look at local uh, enforcement activities and practices is certainly something we see as being in order because it can provide uh, police with the appropriate training so that there's not racial profiling, uh, so that there's not um, a sense that a young black man walking down the street uh, is a threat simply because he, he is a threat. And I would go even further, Reverend Al, to say that we do need something on the order of a truth and reconciliation to deal with the uh, supposed criminalization of young black men, a position that is supported by not only the Congressional Black Caucus, but the, the uh, Pro Progressive Caucus, the Asian Caucus, and the Hispanic Caucus of Congress. Let me, let me ask you, uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander, uh, do, do you believe that Ferguson was a wake-up call to all law enforcement, all police uh, uh, around the country, not just minority police departments or police officers? Absolutely it was. And I tell you what, if we don't pay attention to Ferguson, we're going to be in trouble, and we're going to see this again. Uh, Ferguson actually is going to become the model, I believe, to just suggest to us very clearly that training is going to become key in moving forward. How do, how do we put out equipment that look like military equipment? When do you do that? And clearly, in that scenario where you had peaceful protesters, that was just not appropriate. It's just not me saying that. I've talked to a number of chiefs across this country, and you probably have as well, too. Uh, the appropriateness of it was just not in place. Yeah. But I'm telling you, uh, uh, Ferguson is going to be that city in this point in time in American history that we all can clearly learn something from going forward. And much of what we can learn are things not to do. All right. Well, I'm going to have to leave it there, Dr. Cedric Alexander. And again, thank you, especially Congresswoman Gwen Moore tonight, for coming under the circumstances you did. We appreciate both of you for your time tonight. Thank you for having me.